Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. I'm Michael Stevenson, the president of Simon Fraser University, and it's a great pleasure on behalf of my colleagues uh, to welcome you all to this uh, very important dialogue uh, this afternoon. Uh, welcome to the downtown campus, the Vancouver campus of Simon Fraser University, and especially uh, to this grand facility, the Morris J. Wask Center for Dialogue. The Center for Dialogue uh, is uh, the physical manifestation in part of uh, an aspect of the mission of the university. Uh, it is also very much uh, the creation uh, of a single uh, individual, uh, my very uh, distinguished uh, predecessor, Jack Blaney, uh, who has been a very much a part of the momentum behind the development of the Vancouver campus uh, and really the creative force uh, behind the design uh, of this uh, facility. And it's therefore a very great uh, pleasure uh, to introduce Jack Blaney himself uh, to moderate this dialogue on corporate responsibility uh, and world health. Jack Blaney. Thank you very much, Michael. And it, uh, as I've indicated to a few of my friends, I only have a few, um, that it is an incredible honor to have President Mary Robinson with us today and to receive the Jack Blaney Award. And as I've indicated to others, the award goes to all that great team that has created dialogue to be such an important part of Simon Fraser University. Just very quickly, a couple of words about dialogue. I was asked what dialogue means. I've never actually had to tell anyone before. Uh, I've never written it down, but I had a uh, conversation with Mark Winston the other day and said, you know, what is dialogue? Well, dialogue is conversation. It's conversation with people uh, who are committed to learning together, who want to learn together. So if you learn together, you make several commitments. And one is you make a commitment to uh, withhold judgment, uh, to be curious, like all learners. You make another commitment to share your values. Uh, what are the values that underpin uh, your various kinds of viewpoints and the different viewpoints that might be there. You make a commitment to listen, to understand, and you make a commitment to ask questions to understand. You make a commitment to um, find that, those common interests that all, all human beings share, uh, whether it's in a small community or the global community. You try and find those uh, interests that we all share. There are, they are there that we can use to build, upon which we can build solutions to any kinds of problems that we have. And finally, there's a commitment of treating with respect and treating everybody and respecting everybody as equals. All those who enter the process and all those who make that commitment, you treat all those people as equals. That's roughly and quickly, I think, what dialogue's all about. In a nutshell, it's about learning. So it is with great honor here, great, great pleasure, that we have today, rather than reading the full CV, I just know that we have with us today one of the really true great leaders of the world. We're very, very pleased to ask Mary Robinson to speak to us today. Thank you very much for those warm words of introduction. And it is indeed a great pleasure to open this dialogue on corporate social responsibility and the right to health. And I'd like to thank the WASC Center for Dialogue and everyone who was involved in bringing us and bringing indeed such a top-notch group of representatives from government, from industry, from civil society, and from academia. Our topic, I find, is both timely and challenging. It's particularly timely because today is World Health Day. And this year's theme is make every mother and child count. We need a new approach when we look at the realities. About 530,000 women a year die in pregnancy or childbirth. And many, many of these deaths could be prevented by somebody simply being there who knew what to do. More than three million babies are stillborn and four million newborn children die in the first few days. Indeed, we are aware that over 10 million children a year die before they reach their 10th birthday. And they die of preventable diseases, of hunger, of measles, of acute diarrhea. Um, of malaria because the family can't afford um, a $5 uh, 
malaria net. Indeed, malaria nets shouldn't be paid for at all. They should be made available in infected areas. Our discussion, our conversation is also timely because at long last, global poverty and disease are where they belong, at the top of the international agenda. In this year, 2005, there is renewed attention on fulfilling the promise to fight poverty and disease. And these were the promises made in the year 2000, in September 2000, but which somehow got a bit sidelined and a bit delegated to second or third uh, place in the aftermath of the terrible attacks in the United States of 9-11. When I talk about the promises of 2000, I'm talking, of course, about the United Nations Millennium Declaration adopted in September 2000 by the lar largest gathering ever of government leaders. And this declaration recognized that international objectives such as peace, security, sustainable development, human rights and poverty reduction are actually interlinked. The declaration resulted in a set of eight specific targets and commitments known as the Millennium Development Goals or MDGs. And I've been aware from talking a lot in public that these Millennium Goals are not as well known as either the United Nations or the World Bank or others think they are. I think in this very uh, special gathering, they probably are uh, better known than in uh, general audiences. But they are particularly important because they, there is a timeline of uh, reaching these goals by 2015, and they include having the proportion of those living in extreme poverty and hunger, reducing child mortality, improving maternal health, having every child, girl and boy, have full access to primary education, combating HIV and AIDS, malaria and other diseases, ensuring environmental sustainability, and goal eight, developing a global partnership for development. Of course, the main responsibility for achieving these goals lies with governments. However, there's a growing acknowledgement that governments and international organizations such as the United Nations, the World Bank, or the World Health Organization need help. They need help both from civil society and from the business sector to tackle these major challenges. And this is particularly true of the global health challenges. I'm aware that leading companies are increasingly active in addressing health challenges in partnership with governments and civil society. I'd just like to refer to some of these initiatives and you will know of others, particularly in Canada and here in Vancouver. But uh, initiatives like the Global Business Coalition on HIV and AIDS, the Roll Back Malaria, the Stop TB partnerships, the Merck Gates Botswana partnership against HIV and AIDS, the Novartis programs against leprosy, and the Accelerating Access Initiative and the Medicines for Malaria Venture, to name just a few, show the extent to which public-private partnerships and donation programs are already in place. But the question remains, can or should we expect something more of business in efforts to improve global health? I, in fact, take part in one initiative which has very strong support from the uh, Gates Foundation, the Vaccine Fund, which works with Gavi in immunizing children. And there is uh, a proposal, as you know, for a major new funding for the Vaccine Fund Gavi through using the International Finance Facility, the project uh, particularly supported by Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown. And I have a sense that if we can get this off the ground, it will make a huge difference between talking about an abstraction of an international finance facility and an actual working project that allows an immunization of a whole range of new um, uh, children encouraging countries to be able to expand their programs so that the project has the sort of face of a smiling child. So our dialogue today is challenging because Coming from different backgrounds, we have different expectations, and indeed, we even speak in different tongues. 
the development tongue, the management tongue, the human rights tongue, to name just a few. Not only do we speak different languages, but we've chosen broad and complex concepts to address today. Even the concept of corporate social responsibility, the conceptual response to changing perceptions of the role of business in society is still somewhat elusive. We haven't clarified finally what that responsibility is, though it's an area that we in the project that I'm leading are particularly interested and are working very hard with business in various um, areas. Similarly, the language of human rights can raise difficult questions and uncertainties. Um, the right to health with which we're dealing is a multifaceted and complex human right with wide ramifications. What should be clear to all of us is that dialogue, serious, committed, good faith, multi-stakeholder dialogue is not a luxury. It's actually a necessity. And together, I hope that this interesting group can learn to speak one another's language, to listen carefully to each other. And I hope we can build on our different perspectives and explore the meaning and scope of the right to health in today's world. I also hope that in recognizing the extent of global health challenges, we can develop what we might call a wish list, including a sense of priorities of what needs to be done to improve health for all and what may reasonably be expected from the corporate community. And for my part, I'll do my best to convince you that achieving the right to health is important to business and that there's much that business can do to contribute to realizing this fundamental right for people around the world. So what then is this human right to health? Let me try and answer the question briefly. The right to health is one of an ensemble of internationally protected human rights, which are recognized as the birthright of all human beings under what is sometimes called the International Bill of Rights, that is, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948, and the two principal human rights covenants, which turn the declaration into binding commitments, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. When I'm speaking to audiences in the United States rather than here in Canada, who are often not fully aware of the international human rights framework, I like to emphasize the strong American lineage of contemporary human rights, including the less well-known American lineage of economic, social, and cultural rights, such as the right to work, to an adequate standard of living, to social security, education, health, and participation in cultural life. It's often forgotten that the need for an economic Bill of Rights was first articulated by President Roosevelt in his 1944 State of the Union speech, as he famously said, we have come to a clear realization of the fact that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. Necessitous men are not free men. People who are hungry and out of a job are the stuff of which dictatorships are made. Among the various rights to be included in this Economic Bill of Rights, President Roosevelt cited, and I quote, the right to adequate medical care, and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health. A promise not yet fulfilled in the United States or elsewhere. At international level, the right to the highest attainable standard of health was first inscribed in the WHO Constitution in 1946. And of course, it was reiterated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, which John Humphreys from Canada uh, who led the first human rights secretariat in the UN, played such a central role in drafting, and I'm glad to pay tribute to him again here in this chamber. Article 25 of the Universal Declaration puts it succinctly, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and his family, including medical care. More than half a century later, the right to health is broadly recognized around the world at national, regional, and international levels. First, it's recognized in several binding international human rights instruments. And it's worth referring to how many countries have actually ratified these instruments because we are now getting a, a global legal consensus on right to health. Uh, these include the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which has been ratified by 148 countries. 
the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, ratified by 169 countries, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, ratified by 178 countries, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child, ratified by 192 countries. In addition, numerous regional human rights declarations and treaties, such as the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, and the European Social Charter also recognize the right to health. Furthermore, 109 countries recognized a, a right to health or health care in their national constitutions. In addition, these binding treaties and constitutional provisions are beginning to generate case law and other jurisprudence, which is shedding light on the specific content of the right to health. Clearly, among the international, as opposed to regional or national instruments, the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which Canada has ratified, provides the most comprehensive article on the right to health. It recognizes the right of everyone to the highest attainable standard of health and outlines a number of steps to be taken by governments to progressively achieve the realization of this right. The right to health, as you know, is defined comprehensively, not just the right to health care, but also the right to the underlying determinants of good health, including safe drinking water, adequate sanitation, and access to health-related information. It includes as well freedoms, such as the right to be free from discrimination, and entitlements, such as the right to a system of health protection. It covers numerous elements, including child health, maternal health, and access to essential drugs, and it does have a particular bearing on the rights of indigenous peoples. Importantly, the right to health doesn't mean the right to be healthy, nor does it mean that developing country governments must put in, in place expensive health services for which they have no resources. But it does require governments and public authorities to put in place policies and action plans which will lead to available and accessible health care in the shortest time possible. Ensuring that this happens is a challenge facing every country, and it's that that the human rights framework seeks to assist by a process of accountability. It's also a common challenge which impacts across borders, as we've seen with the spread, for example, of the diseases of HIV and AIDS, or indeed, you'd be particularly conscious here in Canada of the uh, impact of SARS um, a short time ago. So this means we must begin to think about solutions and responsibilities, not only within borders, but also across them as well. And in a way, I like to bring this right down to local community here, for example, in Vancouver, again, with reference to the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights. We don't sufficiently pay attention to the fact that Article 29 of the Declaration talks about duties. It says, everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of his personality is possible. I read that precisely, but of course, it isn't very gender sensitive because this was 1948. So I always prefer to read it again and um, say that everyone has duties to the community in which alone the free and full development of his or her personality is possible. So you are not a full rounded personality. You haven't developed fully as an individual unless you know that you have duties to the community and you do something about it, which I think is really very strong. So now is the time to recognize the shared rights and responsibilities of our global age. The forces of globalization, as we know, can do great good and they can do great harm. The good is obvious, increased prosperity, increased global wealth and improved communications. The harm, unfortunately, is just as glaring. From contagious disease to international terrorism, from environmental decay to economic instability, from refugee flows to unbearable inequality. What is also clear is that decisions made in the boardrooms of the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, or even large multinationals have a very real and direct impact, for good or ill, on the lives of people far away, often in the poorest countries of the world. Fortunately, there is an increasing consciousness of this interconnectedness. We cannot avoid knowing. With images of misery beamed into our living rooms, we can no longer ignore, wall off, or wall out effects of deprivation and despair in distant lands. We saw evidence of this new and I think enlarged sense of duties to the community in the global response 
to the Asian tsunami of last December. People the world over felt they had to do something. There was something biblical about a terrible catastrophe that could affect rich tourists on holiday, poor fishing villages, entire towns being decimated um, on the coast. And people felt they had to do something, to send money, to contribute as an artist uh, to a telethon, to wrap up and pack boxes to send to those in desperate need. And the business community was equally generous in its response. But just as different actors, including business, made an important contribution to the tsunami victims, a similar effort is needed towards the many silent tsunamis of the world. Uh, this, I think, is something that has bothered the AIDS the community of those who work in developing countries. I'm honorary president of Oxfam, and we've discussed uh, how come there was this huge outpouring in response to what was very well covered in the media and people were very conscious of. But there are what um, have been called silent tsunamis. Uh, the fact that over 30,000 children die every day of preventable diseases. Um, in a week, that's a silent tsunami of children alone. And uh, Professor uh, Jeffrey Sachs has referred to the tsunami of poverty, which kills more than 150,000 children every month from malaria alone. The silent tsunami of AIDS kills an estimated five to 8,000 Africans every 24 hours. The silent tsunami of maternal mortality, as I said, as the WHO reminds us today, kills 530,000 women a year. And unbelievably, unsanitary water kills more Africans than war and AIDS together. And the list goes on. So it's crucial to emphasize once again that the main responsibility for tackling these enormous challenges must remain with governments. Yet the world has become too complex, too interdependent for weakened national governments to tackle these global problems on their own. All those who partake in globalization's rewards must, I believe, help also with its downsides. So how do we affect positive change? First, I think we must put pressure on our governments to take their shared commitments to human rights and human development more seriously. And obviously for rich countries, this means a commitment to living up to the uh, promise that has been long made of reaching 0.7% of GDP in order to help fund the implementation of the Millennium Development Goals, as was agreed most recently at the Monterey Conference on Financing for Development. And it's worth looking at what Goal 8 of the Millennium Goals actually said under the title Developing a Global Partnership for Development. It refers to an open trading and financial system that is rule-based and includes a commitment to good governance, development, and poverty reduction. Addressing least developed countries' special needs, including tariff and quota-free access for exports. Enhanced def debt relief and cancellation of bilateral debt and national and international measures to make debt sustainable. And finally, working with pharmaceutical companies to provide access to affordable essential drugs in develop developing countries. So now we come to, I think, the crunch of our dialogue here today. What role should we be thinking about for business in contributing to these aims? Corporations don't vote individually, but they do lobby. So my first suggestion would be that corporations, if they wish to contribute to a more sustainable form of globalization, lobby responsibly and transparently, transparently rather than according to short-term, narrow commercial interests. I think we're all aware of the power, particularly of the big pharmaceutical companies, and the kind of lobbying that has uh, gone on in relation to the uh, TRIPS agreement. The goals for our dialogue, as identified in preparation, include, and I quote, scoping the current state of play, identifying where current gaps exist, and developing a priority list of what's required from the corporate community. This is a big challenge, but I think there are ways in which we can um, look for our um, thinking that we can look to um, for guidance. Um, I participate um, in, on the steering committee of a Davos World Economic Forum initiative called the World Economic Forum Global Governance Initiative. And 
It started in 2003 and examined the performance of four sets of actors in um, progress towards implementing the Millennium Development Goals. The four actors were international institutions, governments, business, and civil society. And in the first report uh, delivered in uh, January 2004, uh, a number of task forces who reported to us on the steering committee, who had experts in poverty, in security and peace, in human rights, in uh, uh, um, health issues, reported that all four actors were falling way below what would be required. In fact, in a score out of 10, the score was three or four averaging out of 10, and 10 was the minimum necessary to implement in uh, the timescale of 2015, the Millennium Goals. And uh, it was decided that for the second year, uh, the uh, Global Governance Initiative would focus on the private sector and look at the responsibility of the private sector in relation to the Millennium Goals. And again, um, the score in the report for 2005 is um, an average of three or four percent, uh, three or four out of ten, meaning um, that uh, the uh, private sector is falling way below. And I thought I would just quote a little bit of um, what the report said on the issue of health. And I quote: "Business is perhaps the most focused, disciplined, and best organized of all the sectors that can contribute to health." Businesses have slowly begun to recognize that they, they have both a role and self-interest in improving health. Health workers are more productive than those who are ill. Sorry, healthy workers are more productive than those who are ill and reduce the need to train large numbers of reserve or replacement employees. A more productive and healthy society also creates greater wealth, purchasing power, and therefore more profitable markets. Businesses have an immediate self-interest in better health of their workers, families, and the communities they serve. But recognition within the business community of its potential, formidable role and the compelling business case for that role has come slowly and for the most part primarily in reaction to HIV and AIDS. The Global Governance Initiative goes on to note that other global health challenges have received insufficient attention and it particularly emphasizes the problem of maternal mortality, which is the focus of the uh, World Health Organization's Health Day uh, this year. And it also notes, no, uh, notes uh, that there is slow progress on uh, the issue of child mortality and that malaria continues to cause more than 300 million cases of illness and 1 million deaths each year and that progress on that has been disappointing. Um, there's also a report which I, I, I would assume that many of you would be um, uh, familiar with, which was commissioned by Secretary General Kofi Annan, entitled Unleashing Entrepreneurship, Making Business Work for the Poor. Um, the commission was co-chaired by Paul Martin, the Prime Minister of Canada, and Ernesto Zedillo, uh, the former President of Mexico. And that report includes a number of recommendations for the public and private sectors alike. In the public sphere, it argues that actions to create an enabling environment for business in the public-private sphere it urges partnership and innovation. In the private sphere, it urges business to engage and mobilize its capabilities and resources. It also includes interesting recommendations on advancing responsible business practices and corporate responsibility standards, noting that so far, and I quote, the possibilities of an alignment between social and commercial interests remain largely untapped, and that business has yet to move beyond the traditional philanthropic or charitable uh, models. Let me stress that projects which have a direct impact on the right to health go far beyond building a health clinic or donating medicines. They include, for example, bringing electricity to rural visit villages, cellular phone services, or even motorcycles for delivering medicines. For their part, large product companies, the companies like Unilever and Procter Gamble's of the world, are uniquely placed to effectively deliver health education and information to millions of poor and often ill-educated consumers. In other words, many businesses beyond the obvious sectors of activity, the food and pharmaceutical industries, do have an ability to make a positive contribution towards the right to health. And in looking at what has been done so far, I believe we're barely scratching the surface when you look at the scale of the problem. When you look at the fact that many of the uh, problems are now 
uh, ones which particularly affect women and girls. Take, for example, the problem of HIV and AIDS, of the some 29 million who are uh, HIV positive or have full-blown AIDS in Africa, 60% are women. And girls between the age of 15 and 24 are, it's now estimated, six times more likely than their boy, young man counterparts uh, to become HIV uh, positive. The project that I now lead, uh, Realizing Rights, the Ethical Globalization Initiative, has addressed right to health, and we have a particular focus on uh, women's health, on stigma and discrimination, on tackling um, problems such as HIV and AIDS and also neglected diseases. And we've partnered with the UNAIDS Global Coalition on Women and AIDS, on which I serve on the Leadership Council, and with the Female Health Foundation to try to gather in new energies to address the problem of HIV and AIDS. We've created the Business Women's Initiative against HIV and AIDS, which is a group of senior women business leaders from around the world, committing, committed to addressing the uh, reality that this is now a disease with a women's face, that women are extremely vulnerable, and that the good projects that are working on the ground, particularly in regions like Sub-Saharan Africa, in India, in China, in the former Soviet Union, in the Caribbean, in other parts of Latin America, the projects that are good tend, without exception, to be underfunded, to be under-resourced, to lack maybe a managerial capability that would lift them to a different stage. So we are building up a catalogue of good practices, of good doing, and a wider circle of businesswomen to interest them in being connected, because we feel that there's a lot of goodwill there, that if people knew, well, what can I do in practice, and are these reliable projects, or am I going to be pouring resources into a dark hole and worries about corruption, etc. So we're trying to make it uh, possible to connect uh, women who uh, recognize that they have power and that this is happening on their watch, that millions of women and girls are becoming infected and are dying, and that in uh, sub-Saharan Africa now, you have uh, uh, something like 12 million um, AIDS orphans, which will go up to 25 million by 2010, and that's in Africa alone. So uh, this is the disconnect between the seriousness of the problem and the measures that are being taken at the moment. And I do think that there is a special role for the pharmaceutical um, industry. And we've been working with um, some uh, leading uh, pharmaceutical firms in discussion um, to try to uh, encourage them to frame their corporate responsibility, to fashion it around the uh, human right uh, to health. Uh, in my view, firms have to go beyond philanthropy as the landmark Oxfam VSO and Save the Children report um, urged, and they have to really uh, examine their corporate policies in at least five areas, in differential pricing of essential medicines, in differential patents, in joint public-private initiatives, in the neglected diseases, the um, uh, 1090 problem that 10% uh, um, that 90% of the research goes into 10% of the uh, disease prevalence, um, because that's the uh, prevalence in the richer countries, and the appropriate use of medicines and ethical drug trials, uh, particularly in the developing world. Um, it's interesting that two groups of investors have recently issued recommendations along the same lines. One is the report of the Pharmaceutical Shareholders Group, whose aim, of course, is to protect the long-term value um, of their investments. The report concludes that most firms still treat drugs for the poor as philanthropy, rather than as part of their corporate responsibility, and have yet to devote enough senior managers to the task. Like the Beyond Philanthropy report, um, the Pharmaceutical Shareholders Group report urges firms to consider systemic differential pricing and or differential patenting in poor countries, as well as increasing their research budgets for diseases of the thir third world. These recommendations are echoed in uh, uh, the report by Henderson Global Investors called Fulfilling Its Potential, Sustainability, Responsibility and Ethics in the Pharmaceutical Industry, an Agenda for Change. 
The report identifies two pharmaceutical companies as leaders in the field of corporate social responsibility, Novartis and Novo Nordisk. And part of the reason for that is because of their participation in the Business Leaders Initiative on Human Rights. So allow me to say a few words about this initiative as an example of what an explicit human rights approach can bring to the corporate responsibility strategies and implementation. The Business Leaders Initiative on Human Rights was started in Brussels in May 2003, modelled on the pre-existing Business Leaders Initiative on Climate Change. Um, that initiative continues under the chairmanship of Margaret Wallström of the European Commission, who at the time was uh, the European Union Commissioner for the Environment and is now the Senior Vice President with responsibility, I think, for communications. Um, the uh, companies um, who committed to the Business Leaders Initiative for Human Rights had a more difficult task than measuring progress in emissions or other factors that would influence climate change. They were committed uh, to uh, looking seriously at the boundary between the clear state responsibility and what is the, the appropriate responsibility of corporations within their sphere of influence. And 10 companies eventually um, uh, committed uh, to this initiative, and they are um, large companies in their different sectors, ABB, Barclays Bank, The Body Shop, uh, The Gap, Hewlett-Packard, MTV Europe, National Grid Transco, Novo Nordisk, uh, Nordisk and Novartis, the, the two pharmaceutical companies, and Statoil. And so they're mainly in, in different sectors. And they have particularly focused on and are prepared to road test the UN norms and responsibilities for transnational corporations and other business. You may recall that those norms were uh, drafted and agreed upon by the subcommission of the United Nations in August of 2003 under the chairmanship of David Weisbrot of the University of Minnesota. And they were put forward to the Commission on Human Rights in its session last year. And they provoked a very tense debate because some parts of industry felt very strongly that uh, the UN should basically keep its nose out of business, that they wanted to be business to be self-regulating and that these norms uh, posed um, very real uh, um, challenges in uh, um, essentially uh, being potentially a, a mandatory standard um, for business. Um, the fact that these major companies had decided to road test the norms and found that in practice there was nothing to worry about. Indeed, they were a good standard, which they would like to see all companies um, adhering to, um, affected the debate. And in uh, Geneva, at the session of the Commission last year, it was decided to ask my former office, the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, to do a kind of survey in a positive way with a view to strengthening corporate responsibility that was in the resolution, to look at uh, the UN norms, to look at the OECD guidelines, um, ILO provisions and others, um, and various measures of corporate responsibility. And the office compiled a very interesting report, which is being considered um, next week, actually, at this session of the Commission on Human Rights. And it's actually hoped that uh, the <clears throat> um, Commission will agree to a resolution which a number of governments, and I think Canada is one of the supportive governments, are putting forward with the idea of having a special representative of the Secretary General on uh, human rights and uh, business and, and transnational corporations um, to carry forward um, this debate. Um, certainly, uh, I have found it uh, very instructive to be the honorary chair of the Business Leaders Initiative on Human Rights and see uh, how uh, constructive it is when led at CEO level and integrated throughout a corporation, you have a willingness to draw up a matrix of how each of the human rights instruments may have relevance for the company within its sphere of influence. And I'll just speak briefly about one of those companies which asked to join us because I think it tells the story. Um, you may recall that about 18 months ago, uh, the gap brought out a social report in which it acknowledged that it had had some problems in its supply chain, 
uh, that uh, some of the suppliers to it had been involved in child labor or exploitative labor conditions. And I know from some of the senior management in the Gap that when they published this, they put their heads down and they said, now we're going to get terrible criticism. But actually, the opposite happened. Um, NGOs said, this is good. The Gap has actually come out with this now and has turned the corner, and we must all be constructive in uh, supporting uh, a new approach. So the Gap started to put certain safeguards in place to ensure that they uh, uh, had a much higher standard of um, what they would uh, accept um, from suppliers in their supply chain and so on, and they um, uh, committed to human rights, and then they asked to join this business um, leaders initiative in order to uh, benefit from the uh, good practices and the consultation with other business. So um, I do believe that there is uh, a willingness on the part of the business sector to engage in human rights, but I do also feel that no single issue is more important than the right to health um, in so far as the business community uh, can really uh, help to make an enormous difference. So I really look forward to our conversation and our dialogue about um, how we engage the power of the corporate sector, how we uh, instill this sense of a duty to community which is wider than a local community and wider than philanthropy that actually goes beyond philanthropy to infuse in uh, corporations um, that sense um, of uh, a responsibility in their sphere of influence uh, to help us to uh, bridge the global inequities um, and these terrible uh, figures that we have um, lived with and somehow must recognize are the tsunamis that are before us to be tackled. So I really look forward now to hearing from you and to dialoguing with you. Thank you very much.